Okay, I'm just setting up the live stream. Bear with me. Okay. So we have a very very quiet day on the prairie. <laughs> I'll give it a few moments, let a few people arrive on the live stream before I start doing anything. Although I suppose I could get the airplane sorted out, couldn't I? So we're in the Boeing 247D, which I have not flown forever. So this is going to be fun. Let me just check the volume levels. OK, my voice is coming through fine. It's a bit quiet, though. Maybe the microphone's a bit too far away from my mouth. That looks OK. OK, so Boeing 247D, what can we remember about how to fly this thing? So fuel tanks look good. We're not going to put passengers in. We're going to put some mail in, though, because that's the main reason for doing this. Um, I guess we could have some passengers just for a bit of fun. or we'll space them out so they don't get on with each other. <laughs> And let's go and put some of this stuff in around the aeroplane just so you get to see it. So you'll see the doors opening and things like that as they work around the aeroplane, getting everything sorted out. So they're just putting the baggage truck in front and opening the front door. And obviously we've got the, the post bags to go in and the packing cases for the passengers. So if you've never seen the Boeing 247D before, it's really, really good. It's probably one of the best vintage aircraft available in the simulator. End of story. But it does require a fair amount of um, patience, shall we say. <laughs> um, because there's things in it like working fuses and it's very easy to blow various fuses around the airplane, but you do get lots of spares. You can see I've used one of them already while well, I was just um, reminiscing with the airplane and finding my way around it again. So there's interesting things like these switches that aren't wired up because um, the airplane was retrofitted late in its life with a radio strapped to the roof and they left the old switches there, <laughs> which is, I think is quite amusing. Um, it's got clutches for the, the various levers, although they're really just there for um, decoration purposes. It's got a fuel pump here, a waggle pump, for getting the oil pressure and fuel pressure up. So you can see, is it going to work? Oh, actually, no, I'll, I'll need to uncork the valves first, won't I? So let's go for both. And So having uncork the valves, I'll have to go and do this again later, but... You can see, here we go. So you can see the fuel pressure up there. <laughs> it's very cool, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, so we'll go and remove all those things from away from the airplane. And we go next page and we've got, well, I'm going to use the simplified start because I don't want to sit here for half an hour trying to diagnose what might be wrong with the airplane. <laughs> So we're going to go mixture rich and we're going to use the mouse to do it. It's a bit odd, some of their decisions here and there about how things work. You can't drag the mixture levers, for example. You have to use the mouse wheel on them or just map a button to move the mixture. So throttle controls, I've got those mapped to levers, which is fine. Um, we will leave the oil shutters open. We'll leave the carburetor air on cold. It's a lovely day. I doubt we're going to have to fiddle with any of that. Um, the propeller, again, same deal. Look, we're going to have to increase the propeller RPM. Ready for takeoff with the mouse wheel. You've got the master power button here. So I can't remember if you can open the panels on this aeroplane. I think you can somehow to see the batteries. It's got some massive lead acid batteries in the wing roots. Um, Anyway, so uh, trying to remember what we have to do. So magnetos need to go to both. 
on both engines. And we've done the fuel. The radio power doesn't need to come on yet. We can go and prime the engine. So let me get the clipboard. Oh, actually, I'll leave the clipboard there for the moment. We'll just work around it. So we'll go for the, the right engine first, I guess. And prime it a few times. And then we'll use the waggle pumps. I can't remember if you have to go left engine first or right engine first. Does anybody know? I do read the chat, but I'm busy looking at the screen. So when people start ranting at me in the chat about not reading it, it's usually because I'm concentrating. So I'm looking at the fuel gauges up here. So I'm going to pump the pressure up and we'll wind up the flywheel on that right engine. You will see a, a hand crank appear over there, but there'll be no person attached to it, which is a bit of a shame. While we're waiting for that, let's go and turn. Do we have a... we'll put the nav lights on at least. And we don't need any of the others yet. So yeah, you can see that they're spinning up the flywheel on the engine, so we'll keep the pressure high. see it's turned green over here we'll give it a few more seconds and we need to make sure the throttle's cracked open and we have an engine okay now the same deal for the left engine so we flick over the engine selector we prime it We ask the guy outside to go and wind up the flywheel, which essentially means... God, it's loud, isn't it? Let me just check the volume level for you. Okay, you can still hear me. So yeah, you can see the hand crank goes in here. You wouldn't want to be stood on a, on a wooden step stair that close to the engine, would you? Or not that close to the propeller, I mean. Okay, so we need to get that pressure back up. Waggle, waggle, waggle. And mesh. And bizarrely, you can't hear it very easily. So I wonder if something's gone wrong with the sound there. Anyway, we have engines. Yeah, I'm just reading the live stream comments there with Far Isle on about the Alpha. The Alpha's famous for having some built-in abilities, shall we say, <laughs> where flicking various switches throws lots of things at once. I think it might even do a control E. Um, okay, so let's go and turn some power on around the place now. So we've got the... we'll put the pita heat on, we'll put the engine instruments on, the nav instruments on, the compass light on, the cabin lights we don't need, it's a lovely day. Dome lights we don't need. Courtesy lights we probably don't need. Okay, so we're pretty much almost well, almost ready to go. Calibrate the altimeter. Just check the fuel, it's all good. It's actually remarkably straightforward after, after that rigmarole. So we can turn this radio on up here. And that's the light for the radio, we don't really need that. Um, I'm just trying to think. So I've got the route actually mapped out, even though we'll be following beacons visually. But on the route, we've got the radio beacon, so the 247D comes with radio stations. <laughs> so we've got this one, KSL1140. Um, we don't really want to listen to 1920s music, do we? Maybe we'll do it when we're flying along if we get really bored. So, or may maybe we'll have a quick look. So, I have to remember how this works now. So that's that one. What did we say it was? 1240. Or 
what? No, uh, I've forgotten now what I said. 1140. 14. Okay, so how do we get to the next band? Oh, here we go. Expecting to hear that. Maybe a bit too far away. I thought CW had to be on to hear it. Or maybe we've blown the fuse on it. Anyway, let's go and just fly the route, shall we? We'll put up with having no radio. We might pick the radio up once we're in the air, of course. So, the main thing that this is going to introduce into the simulator, quite apart from all of these airfields that didn't exist before, if we have a look outside. So, this is an airfield that wasn't in the simulator before. It's a very loose airfield, 1920s airfield, basically, with cut grass. Um, quite apart from that, at each waypoint shown on little nav map as a, a black and white triangle, there will be a beacon. Okay, so we're taking off from here. So we're going to be heading northwest. There will be beacons. So each of these waypoints, there is a 50-foot tall mast with a light on top flashing. And that's how the first navigation was done with the mail routes. So let's go and get in the air. So come off the parking brake. Ease the throttles forwards. Let's put the head tracking on and center it up. with momentum with the tail swinging round. There we go. As long as you've got some thrust over the tail, it's much more controllable. You can see the flashing beacon here at the airfield. If you look out across the hills, you'll see another one. There's the next one. So we're going to do a right turn. And we'll pull the throttles back. There's no need to thrash the engines to pieces. We'll have a look at the engine condition on the way out. Make sure we're not killing it. Look at the needles jumping around. So we should see that first beacon. There we go. So we're going to follow the flashing lights, basically, all the way. But something else that's been added via this add-on, as well as the beacons, are intermediate airfields. So there were lots of airfields put on the... or cut into the fields of the, the airmail routes that allowed the aircraft carrying the mail to stop and refuel, you know, replace fluids or whatever they needed to do. 
Oh, I'm just trimming the aeroplane out. So we're just looking down here at the vertical speed indicator. So we've got airspeed here in miles an hour. We've got um, fuel gauges obviously here. We've got altitude. So the Boeing 247 is quite similar. Obviously the layout's different, but it's quite similar in terms of the the gauges you have to a modern aircraft. Well, it's kind of the, it's the first airliner really. Should we reduce the RPM a little bit? So we'll come past this first beacon quite low and then I'll start having a look at the live stream in a moment. So we're in the 247D, just reading the comments there. It's from the 1920s and 30s, so that's why it looks Art Deco. Because <laughs> it is Art Deco. <laughs> there is a, a panel you can open up. I can't remember if you can lift this while you're in the air. I don't remember how it works. I'm not going to fiddle with it too much. Okay, so you can see there's a beacon coming up on the ground down here. When we get closer to it, you'll be able to see it. And you should, in the distance, start to see the next beacon. There's the next one. So it's very much line of sight, because this is before radio navigation. Although this aircraft does have uh, the, um, the radio, the earliest form of, or the precursor to VOR navigation. You can listen to Morse codes. Or not, they're not really Morse. They're just sequences of beeps that are being broadcast. And from, t from the sequence of beeps, you can figure out what quadrant you are from a, a radio mast. So you can see the beacon down there on the mast. Now we can't quite see that one. I'll, I'll reduce to an even lower altitude for the next one. Each mast has a concrete arrow on the ground beneath it pointing towards the next mast. So in low visibility you can at least head in the correct direction. So we'll, we'll reduce height and power, try and descend some pylons down here. And we'll come in low past the next one so you get to have a proper look at the, the beacon. So you can see the next one's way out in the distance, look. If we, when we get around the hill, we'll probably find that there's a route around the valley. If we go and have a look at the map to confirm that, yeah, look. So I think we're probably seeing the one right the way over there. Yep, there's the next one. Look, just as we can see on, the, on our map. Obviously, we've got the benefits of a GPS map. It's very cool, though, isn't it? So you can follow the old routes. So the great thing to do this in would be like an old biplane or something. I've chosen the 247D just because I haven't flown it for ages. So we're coming in low, we're going to have to be careful. I've got the power lines add-on installed, so there's probably going to be wires down here, I think. That I'll have to be careful about. Or oh, I thought I had. Maybe I haven't got the, the US regional part of it on. I just want to come in low over this mast to show you what's on the ground underneath it. So there should be an arrow pointing that way. Underneath the mast. Can you see it there? Down there? Well, it's obscured by the building, actually. That's a shame. Maybe the next one will be easier to see. Let's get a little bit of height. So 
So are there any altitude restrictions? Well, back in the 1920s, there were no real um, laws to do with flying. None of the rules had been written. So, yeah, the aircraft doing this route would have been the only air... or well, very nearly the only aeroplanes in the air. And they would have descended to go and look at the... Um, Obviously, pilots that had done the route endlessly would know it, but in poor weather, I guess it would help if you didn't know the landscape. So, I don't know the landscape, so I could just try and follow the beacons. Obviously, we're going a bit, fair bit faster than the aeroplanes that would have flown the route. You'd have been looking at things like the, um, the Boeing PT-17, the uh, Steersman. Steerman even. There's two versions, isn't there? There's PT-17 and the Model 75. I forget which one's which. One's the military one, one's the... Um, the commercial one. The one for the public. Strange out here, isn't it? Notice how the back of the... Nav lights are painted black, so they don't blind the the crew. So the mast is just coming down here, isn't it? So let's do this from the outside view this time. Look at the ground underneath the mast. Look at the arrows. And this one doesn't have any. <laughs> they don't all have them. But we can obviously see the next one. It's way out ahead of us. On the hillside. Am I happy with the Toby Eye Tracker? Pretty much. I think it has its limits. It's not super accurate. So although you can use it, I, I typically, typically use it just to, as a director of, of sorts. So I can point the camera for presentation purposes. So if I'm talking about something and looking in a certain direction, it helps. I think you can overuse it. So you get people doing this and it makes you, everybody feel sick. So I have become quite conscious of holding the same direction for a while each time I move my head and turning it off if I'm looking around to like read the live stream for example otherwise if I look at the screen you're, all you're going to see is the engine in the cell while I'm busy reading the laptop next to me so I've become you know a bit more practiced at it it's a bit it's terrible in terms of if you're clicking on small click spots because it does drift a little bit so, and that's partly the simulator with aeroplanes moving around in the wind. Um, but if you want to go and click something and make sure of it, it's easier just to lean in. Because then obviously the lateral movement isn't as much. Obviously if you're right the other side of the cockpit and you're trying to click something that's like three pixels across, then it becomes tricky. So you do learn to lean in to do things. But that helps anyway. If you're demonstrating, it helps to go close to something anyway, so that people can actually see what you're talking about. So
So in terms of the temperatures in the T47D, yeah, don't run the engine flat out. <laughs> so all temperatures are fine. So we can see the next beacon. So I'm basically running the engine 70%, turn the RPM down to about 80%. See, uh, manifold pressure is nowhere near limits, so I could push it up, but I'm inclined not to. You just have to keep an eye on the, the gauges, really. As long as you don't thrash the engine, it will keep running for hours and hours and hours. And you'll never have a problem. He says. <laughs> Famous last words. Okay, so where's the next beacon? going to have to cheat. Now if we look at the ground, it's under the shed again isn't it? It's pointing this way. It's out that way somewhere. There it is. You can see them. Going off into the distance, look. There it is, look. And there's the next one. Yeah, so if you can't see it, you can always double back and look for the concrete arrow on the ground. I think the the best aeroplane for giving people PTSD is the um, the DC-6 because it just has this habit of you'll notice you've got the four sets of engine dials in the middle of the cockpit and you'll just notice one of the engines starting to diverge from the others. It's very, very good at it. And you just end up all the time being absolutely paranoid about temperatures and pressures and... RPMs and manifold pressure, it's just, yeah, it terrifies you. But it's probably the best engine simulation in the simulator. Especially when you're flying at altitude and having to play games with uh, water injection and superchargers, and it's, it's fantastic fun. while we're flying along and have a look at the map see we can find another radio station beacon somewhere uh, they're little little flags aren't they is there one over this way somewhere where we might be looking for something that's not going to appear I'm only going to fly part of the route by the way I'm not going to fly the whole route because the whole route would take us right the way across to San Francisco but we'd be here until tomorrow morning. <laughs> That's why there are intermediate stops. I'm just wondering if we can pick up another radio station. They look like these little flags. I don't think we can. That was 1410, wasn't it? I wonder if there's one directly behind us over here. 1140. 1410, 1140. Okay, let's go and have a look at that again. zero that was that one lost it now there it was one four one zero let's try it I might have this 
misconfigured. That's the light switch. That's ah. Did I turn the radio on down here? There we go. <laughs> and I've lost sight of the beacons now. That's my own fault. Where are they? Yeah, they're off to our right, look. There we go. Some uh, authentic 1920s radio stations. It's great, isn't it? It's brilliant fun. But it just goes to prove, you know, the um, before you had very high frequency radio. The radio kit used in aircraft could pick up commercial radio. Of course, it's not what it's designed for. It's designed for the um, picking up the Morse towers. Or not, they're not Morse, I keep saying that. Um, there's a, a CSV file you can load in that will put all of the towers in. I'm not sure if I've got it actually. It's a scenery. Um, where is it? User points. If I import the CSV, radio range stations, if I pull it in, there we go, look. So they're going to appear as tacans on here, which isn't what they really are, but I'm not sure. They'll be black tacan, tacan icons. There's one. So 281, we'd have to tune it into. Is that any closer to us? There's one over here, look. There's one behind us. There's one over here, 302. So let's tune that one. So that beep sequence, you have to read the book for this. It's probably in the clipboard as well, actually. Let's have a look. The beep sequence means something. Yeah, here we go, look. So you can tell which quadrant you are in by what you're hearing. So I'm southwest. The beacon. Does that make sense? Anyway, I'm going to turn that off. Because that could get really annoying really quickly. <laughs> Let's put the clipboard back away. Okay, so we are, let's have a look on the map, find out where we are. So we're just heading across the, um, the middle of nowhere, basically, on the borders of Utah. So we're heading towards the tree of Utah, which I've never seen in the simulator, so I have no idea what that is. when you see features like this in the desert, isn't it? You wonder what caused that. So 
So what speed are we doing? Can we push it on a bit? So we're doing 140 knots, which isn't bad for a Boeing 247. The manifold pressure on the sim's just frozen. Give it a second. Manifold pressure is quite low, so if we were to push this on into the white area, let's try having a play then, see what sort of performance we can get out of this thing. Let's close the oil shutters, which we should have done anyway. And while we were flying along, we've completely lost sight of the beacons, haven't we? So it should be, it's probably out there, out of sight, there we go. It was behind the pillar when I was looking around. noticed even the cables sway. It's, it's quite amazing how far they've taken it with the modelling of this aeroplane. Okay, so we were going to push the engines a bit, weren't we? So we've pushed the manifold pressure up a little bit. Let's see what happens then if we push the RPM on. That effect that's not affecting manifold pressure as such. I'm just trimming the aeroplane to stop it climbing. Because obviously as we increase in speed, the wings generate more lift. So coming up through 160 knots. They can shift, can't it? Up towards 170 knots. Obviously we're in a slight Descent 250 feet a minute. So there's the next beacon way in front of us. So obviously, we need to keep an eye on oil temperatures. They're a little bit hotter, not too bad. Oil pressure's fine. or fuel pressure is fine. RPM is pretty high, not too bad. Is there a red line? I don't think there is. But just out of um, sanity's sake, I'm going to pull the RPM back. I don't want to thrash the engine. I'll, I'll run the manifold pressure in the white area, but towards the lower half of it. God, it's so desolate out here, isn't it? It's not very stable, is it? The other thing you can do in this aeroplane, I'm not sure if it will show while we're in flight, you can actually tap the glass. The, some of the instruments can get stuck. So you'll notice again the fuel gauges aren't showing anything. You have to pull these and then they'll show. And you wait for it to stabilise and then it will drift back down again. It's very cool. I just think it's fascinating from an engineering perspective to see how things were done and how, you know, how the evolution happened between the different aeroplanes. It's like, you, obviously, a lot of people will say, you take a look at the 247D, you can see a lot of similarities in the B-17 in its nose. So if you were to add two more engines to this, you've essentially got 
half of a B-17. So, you know, the, um, the design for the B-17 was essentially an upscaled version of this, and then obviously the Strato liner was a B-17 with a, a non-militarised version of it. Ah, somebody behind me. I think I'm on Southeast Asia today. I'm not sure on the service. Should I go and switch on transmitter? Then people will be able to see me on that as well. Uh, connect. I'll just check the server to make sure. Yeah, I'm on Southeast Asia. So what I've just switched on is a little red aeroplane on little nav map. So anybody that's got transmitter set up be able to see that and it updates every few seconds. Oh we went past the tree of Utah. What did we miss? Is that it? Should go back. speed I guess. I've come back to 50% throttle just as I make the turn back. Descending quite steeply, 2,000 feet a minute. Or thereabouts, probably a bit steeper than that but that's as high as the gauge goes. Right, let's go back and have a look at this feature. Pushing 190 miles an hour, I don't really want to descend any faster than this. That's what happens if you pull the throttles to idle. Doesn't like it. Okay, so it's an art installation of some description. Okay. On to the next beacon. Something new every day. Oh, here comes the other one. Crikey, he's shifting. formation for a bit. I'll come in behind you.
going to slow down because there's no flaps on these things. side. some 1920s music on while we're flying. Is there anything over this way or are all the stations over towards the other direction? I think they were, so it'll probably be getting a bit faint. Um, we had one here, didn't we? 1410. So let's try that again then. Five sims sim locked up, that's a shame. I wonder if we can tune it to get it a bit louder. There is, oh no, this is a proper airfield. <laughs> this is Wendover. And then I think we're, yeah, we're led around in an arc to get through the hills to stay at low altitude though. Obviously we're flying quite high at the moment. So we are at uh, 8,200 feet. Obviously this is the high desert, isn't it? This part of the US. How are we doing in terms of engine? Oil temperature is looking fine. RPM 
RPM is still high, but I, that's because I'm running it quite high. Yeah, it's still on flat out. Let's just take it away from the edge. So just turning the RPM down a little bit. descend over the next few minutes. There's no need to be this high. long is the flight? I have no idea. I was going to try and just get to one of the intermediate airfields. There's one here, look, at uh, Shafter. So we'll probably get to that one to this evening, just for this demonstration flight, so not far around the corner. And maybe put the airplane down. Just I'm interested to see what these intermediate airfields look like. Because I've not seen one. Yeah, anybody that's um, learned how to side slip in Flight Simulator, side slipping was invented for aircraft before flaps. It was the primary means of slowing down on descent before flaps were invented. So you present the side of the fuselage to the airflow to slow yourself down, which you can obviously do with this look. So I can push, dip the right wing, left rudder, and watch the speed coming off. Yeah, look at the speed falling off. It's down here, look. Works very, very well. And it's picking it back up now, look. 150, 155, 160. Beacon on the hilltop up there. Just aiming for it. So it's an interesting one actually. So we're aiming, you can see there's the beacon on the hilltop. But presumably they would have had notes to say, you know, you're turning before that. Because you're going to see the next one at like 70 degrees to it. Mind if I turn the radio off? It's really um, starting to get on my nerves. <laughs> so 
So yeah, as someone mentioned on the stream a few minutes ago, flaps were invented. Um, was it late 20s or early 30s? Oh no, mid 20s. I guess if you go far enough back, you get to aeroplanes before ailerons were invented as well. Although they were very early that they figured out ailerons. But before ailerons were invented, they had wing warping. Where the controls would actually, you know, twist the wing. I guess they were copying the way birds worked. It hadn't occurred to them to have actual, you know, surfaces within the wing. Of course, then you have to go all the way up to the 1950s for the flying tail that allowed the sound barrier to be broken. And the, um, the discovery about the shock waves. That's a fascinating subject. If you've ever, if you've never seen any documentaries about it, you know about the trouble they had understanding what was going on in the transonic and supersonic realm killed a lot of pilots before they figured out what was happening. Well, um, just reading the comments there about the drag with biplanes, the other problem they had was the engines were rubbish. You know, obviously compared to modern engines, but we've got modern metallurgy, modern measurement of, you know, and a machining of parts. The engine, the power output by the early aviation engines was very, very low. For, you know, for the weight. Thrust versus weight was very low. Yeah, just reading the comments there, it is amazing that the people were building aeroplanes before they really understood how they worked. <laughs> it's stunning, really. The um, aerodynamics equations are still unsolved. There's no proof of, you know, that the observed, that, that matches up the observed phenomena. Um, with uh, you know any formulas that describe it, there's a set of problems. I think it's called the Yang-Mills equations, or some of them. And they they were part of the Millennium Prize. Was it the X Prize or something? It was called. There was um, a group of investors put some money up at the turn of the millennium, say, and that was one of them. Was the the aerodynamics math. And they say, you know, the, the, the commonly band, banded around kind of um, quote then is that if anyone ever solves the math behind aerodynamics, the shape of aeroplanes will change very quickly. You know, because they'll have a, a definitive way or a, a trusted model with which to design the shapes. It's the same reason that all the computational fluid dynamics things don't work accurately. And why, you know, Formula, Formula One teams sometimes get it wrong, for example. Okay, so we've got the next beacon, there we go. And we can see the one on the hilltop in the far distance. That's quite cool, isn't it? Well, I've just read in the comment there about a job for AI. Well, that might be right in terms of um, structural loads and things like that. If AI's knowledge of the way air works is wrong, which it will be, 
because we don't know perfectly how air works, which is why we keep changing the shape of design of things, then it will have imperfect data. So AI is only as good as the as its knowledge then, if you want to put it that way. And if its knowledge is faulty, which is why on like structural calcs you get these crazy algorithms that you know make structures, three-dimensional structures that save weight. They don't do it by having an informed go at it. They do it by brute force. Of trying every shape possible. You know, a few billion times. And then simulating the stresses on the shape. But they, by doing that, they come up with novel methods that a human would never have come up with. <laughs> Yeah, evolution does it that way. Evolution has a few billion goes. And it's survival of the fittest. DNA is not replicated perfectly on purpose. The slight variations is the whole butterfly effect thing, isn't it? The slight variations um, cause... Combin what do they call it? Combinatorial explosion in the end result. So you get a huge variety of um, slight differences, even within the same species, you know, the same family, even. Should we descend down and have a close look at this beacon as we come by? the throttle back to 50% and keep an eye on the airspeed we're coming up to about 180 miles an hour 170 miles an hour the speed's coming off a little bit I'm going to try and come in from the grass side just so we get some view of the beacon as we come by Yeah, there's been some amazing developments in aerodynamics if you start reading about it. Things like the, um, the Coke bottle shape that they discovered in the 50s when they were trying to make fast jet fighters to manage the pressure wave as it passes over the airframe. It's amazing, you know, the, the chance discoveries that were made. So this should have an arrow. Yeah, it's underneath the shed, look. <laughs> Pointing out towards that hill. And now I can't see where the other beacon is, so I'm not... I'm going to have to climb. There it is. It's right on top of the hill in front of us. How are we doing with fuel? It would help if it didn't wangle all over the place, wouldn't it? Oh, that's the fuel pressure, though, isn't it? That's not the fuel level, so we need to be careful of that. So if we uh, pull this out... Now, this is where you need to be careful with this aeroplane. We are using the big tank on the left. And you can choose which tank you are... Yeah, look, right-hand fuel gauge, main and auxiliary. So that was the right one. We were just testing main, which obviously hadn't moved because we're using the left tank. The left tank, we've got about 50 left. OK. Um, I have no idea if the beacons are still there, if any of them are still standing. That would be a really good question. If you go Google it, I'm sure you would find photographs of some of them. I bet some of them are probably protected, you know, for history. I 
I don't know if they were staffed or whether they had um, monitoring stations you know, or somebody that did the rounds, I guess, checking them I don't know how they provided power either whether it was um, a generator on site or a cable you would imagine back in the day it might have been a generator there might be a generator house I imagine it, they were probably only around for a 10 year period because as soon as the radio navigation got good enough there would be no purpose to have them but the masts may have been reused of course let's do this from outside even dotted around the valley. So, I will call it a night at this Ventosa airfield, I think. Which I should find It's over here somewhere. Is that going to be it there? So we've got the closest one to us. Yeah, so it's that is Ventosa then, where we can see that beacon. So we'll fly straight for it. And we'll hope the undercarriage works, otherwise we'll have to hand crank it. Although we can swap the fuses out if it does blow up. The, um, the electric motor on the undercarriage on this plane is notoriously fickle for failing. But there is a, a hydraulic hand crank over here, which you can use to drop the wheels. This aeroplane has very, very good um, fire simulation. If you set fire to the engine, you do get flames pouring out and black smoke belching out behind the aeroplane. So this is an intermediate airfield. They were all temporary, you know, makeshift airfields. So they're all rough ground. But there may be a shed down there. I think typically it was just a light, a shed, and a piece of cleared scrubland. circle and figure out best place to land is for this intermediate station so I've come back to 50% throttle let's go and reopen the um, flaps or well, not flaps the um, cowls So yeah, you can see there's some buildings down here. Is there a hangar? There might even be a hangar. Which way's the wind? So we're heading directly into the wind now. But it's only six knots. So I'm inclined to come and land up this way. No, there are no buildings unless they're not nearby. Am I in the right place? No. That's absolutely bizarre. So there's a beacon that's not marked. Why is that? Oh, 
Okay, you can see the dirt strips. Yeah, there's the airfield. But why was there a beacon over there? That's absolutely bizarre. Unless that was just, ah, uh, maybe I've got the, um, we love VFR add on. That may have been a, a normal modern radio mast with a navigation warning light on top of it. That would make sense, wouldn't it? So the wind's dropped to no wind now, so we can basically choose the dirt strip we want. But we'll overfly first and have a look at. Yeah, okay, so you can see this now, this makes sense. Look, we've got an airstrip coming in and buildings at the far end. So if we turn around, let's see if we can get the wheels down. So we're doing about 100 knots, so we should be able to put the wheels down. Notice, as I dropped the wheels, I had to impart an awful lot of elevator. And the aeroplane started to shake. You can hear it vibrating. We're down to 70 miles an hour. Drag from the wheels is enormous. aren't going to hit those sheds, or whatever they are. And we're down. That was nice and smooth for a change. So I'm using the elevators to force the tailwheel into the ground. Open the engines back up so they don't stall. Very cool. So I presume to kill the engines we just pull the mixture back.
we go. And then we have to turn everything off. Because this, I think this aeroplane remembers everything. So you have to go through the motions inside the aeroplane to make sure you go and switch anything off that you switched on. Uh, that was already off. That was off. We don't want the radio on. <laughs> That's the master battery power switch there, so that will kill everything anyway. Very cool. So we could get the clipboard out, if I can click on it. There we go. And we can service the engines. Oh yeah, we can open the battery compartment. I was talking about that, wasn't I? See, there's the row of batteries. There's some serious batteries in there, aren't there? Um, what else are we doing? So if we come back out. We'll put the wheel chocks in place, put the passenger stairs in place, open the passenger door, put the loading platforms in place. I can hear something somewhere. Is that him? Being the noise so and so over there. Doesn't sound very healthy, does it? Uh, this is the Boeing 247D for anybody that's interested. It's in the um, the notes of the video. So we've stopped at an intermediate airfield because this video has been going on long enough really. Or this stream I should say. I don't think his engine sounds very healthy. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to leave it there. Hopefully you've enjoyed this and I'll put the clipboard back away and sign off. I didn't actually walk down the aeroplane did I? So yeah, the aeroplane is amazingly modelled. As you can see, we can go wandering around and go and walk outside. It's very cool, isn't it? Anyway, I'm going to leave it there. I hope you enjoyed that. I'll see you again soon.